Napoleon. Forgive my words if they are scattered, and my ink if it smears, for I have just received an education in haste. And whether I am barely alive or wholly safe, the distance I've traveled from harm is yet to grant me any rest. I should say we have traveled. Alas, permit me tell you the whole tale. Your last reply was appreciated, though certainly hard to accept. I poured over every line in increasing misery. Even amidst these halls of the Odasan Citadel of Kadasa, with its sheer and resplendent achievements of effort and design, glowing like an endless dawn, your conclusions left me agitated and joyless. My first resolve was to search every connection I had made among the dwarves for some insight into our new dilemma. This was selfish, of course, and madly so. It garnered me nothing, and after one such exchange with an elder dwarf named Oldern, I believe, I swung my fist in anger at a stone statue. Pitying my whimpers, he turned back to me and loosed a soft but clear suggestion. Perhaps, Narian. You should stop asking dwarves about the language of dragons. Watching him trudge slowly away down the hall, my heart sparked and I bore a wild idea. I ran to my room, bathed, wrapped my injured hand which still aches in this frigid air, and prepared to find my own way to... Yes, it sounds utterly foolish now, but a dragon... By providence, this desire was ruined with the next morning's wind, driving sheets of thick snow past the windows of my bedchamber. This citadel is breathtaking, Kaolian, and I was forced to consider the strong winter it was protecting me from. Such a wilderness lay off Kadasa's border, and I knew no way upon it, through it, or way to anything like a dragon. I began to question my resolve. Even my sensibilities, foolishness, crept over me in a way I'd felt as a boy when first presented with true men of war, and realizing my wooden sword was too dull to split anything but the air. I was a child when I first glimpsed a dragon. I had a fascination with the birds of Terminus and the wooded plains around Haven Song are heartily populated with them. I was perched within one such grove when a shadow fell over me. Indeed, the entire grove was eclipsed by a fleeting darkness. Higher than the misty clouds that hover around the rones, the beast flew, circling twice that I observed. A simple, soundless gray dragon, sailing on the wind streams that flow through the skies. This titan, massive yet unspectacular among the host of dragonkind, gliding like the smallest gull. My eyes chased after it, and though I ran furiously, my gaze fell breathless as it coursed east in slow, easy beats until I could see it no longer. The morning I woke to this winter, after scolding myself for entertaining such an idea the night before, I sank into malaise and something like sadness. I refused food, fresh garments, and all but mead. This was not just indulgence. The old Dawson dwarves brew it with something else than honey. Strong but not sour and hot, like drinking flame at first but ending with a chill. Days went by. How many I am no longer certain, for they all rolled like wobbly spheres between my feet and the stone floor. Weakly I passed over them, usually, into my bed. I had such strange dreams in those evenings, often waking in sweaty panic. Yet in the midst of one peaceful night I was shaken awake by a hooded figure, seemingly dwarven, with a voice I did not recognize. Get up quickly. There are warm coverings on the other side of your bed. Put them on, all of them, 
and with great haste. I felt no need to object. So certain was this voice, and so uncertain was I that this wasn't another near lucid dream. The garments were dense and heavy, and next to a glowing fire they made me unbearably warm. The one who woke me returned in moments, chiding me again to rush with my boots and uncomfortably offering to help, which I refused. We exited to the hall and then down a corridor or two. Soon we were in places unfamiliar to me, which opened to the depths of the citadel I could not have imagined. Just as I felt the need to speak my first words of the evening, my guide, I was nearly certain he was dwarven now due to his stature, stopped before a seamless stone wall and abruptly grabbed my wrist. When I depart, and you can no longer see me, push right here. The dwarf pressed my hand on a perfectly nondescript spot on the towering slab as if it were clearly marked. When I departed, understand? I nodded at this. Good. The dwarf paused, studying me for a length I felt nearly unkind, probably noting my profuse sweating. At length he spoke. I don't want to know what you're after, but this will be a lifetime of firsts, human. He paused again, huffed, then turned away, muttering a handful of indiscernible phrases, leaving me in near total darkness and my hand held fast against the stone. Thus I waited, yawning, and when I could no longer see him, I pushed. A six-sided sliver of the stone gave, though I needed both hands to push. Once this piece slid in up to my elbow, an entire six-sided door pushed in as well, appearing out of the seamless rock. Astonished, I slipped through to a descending hall with orbs of light tethered to each wall in a volley d'array. Frigid air whistled around me from the unseen below, and I regarded the clothing provisions very well. The hidden door then sealed up behind me. Turning quickly, I placed a hand on the frozen stone and lingered there for a moment letting my fingers run across the grooves and smooth places. With no alternative, I turned back to the hidden hall. Stepping down the stone-cut steps for what seemed like a quarter of an hour. Near the end of my descent, an unexpected noise began to infiltrate the stillness. It was quite alarming when I recognized it, but unmistakable. The sound coastal waves make when they lap against rock. I was reminded of the line from the sailor's hymn I'd often heard within the tavern of Runun. The tides, a song which never sleeps. And in that moment, I too no longer craved sleep, for in the midst of night my mind was beginning to dawn. As I exited the final step onto a thin wave of a mooring, I saw a vast stretch of sea with hazy fog upon it and a thin coast beyond. Under the flint-struck stars, the harmony was a buffer to the biting cold. There was also a boat, not much greater than a common dinghy. It was watched over by a very large, oddly placed statue with a hooded cloak obscuring its face. Good evening, Narian of Havensong. A hooded statue that was now speaking, of course, to me. Excuse me, I exclaimed, and did so while nearly falling back into the water. I, I beg your forgiveness, sir. Sir? I thought I heard a chuckle in reply, unhindered by my surprise and seemingly very much expecting me. He motioned to the boat. Time must not be misused, young Castigue. Uh, of course, I replied and carefully obliged. His voice was deep and rich, even when soft, almost as though it was rising up from a vast cavern or carried through a magnificent cathedral before leaving his mouth, never losing its fullness. The boat was sturdier than I expected. It felt natural to take a seat in the bow, and I watched the towering figure enter gracefully at the stern. I noted what I assumed to be a rather wide hilt or handle lift his outer cloak as he sat, just behind his left shoulder. We set off on the easy waves, 
though it drew no notice at the time, and I'm still not certain how exactly the craft ferried, for neither of us rowed. There were no oars or sails, and yet we sped along well. My stoic companion held the head of a steering paddle under his right forearm, which kept us on a precise line toward the shore. Now becoming more clear in the distance, I began to feel cold from lack of movement. The breaking waves foretold of nearing land, and I could now discern another figure, cloaked and motionless, standing upon the snow-covered shore. As we made land, I considered the final words of the dwarf who woke me, and how easily I had acquiesced. I was now in a new realm, in the pit of night, in the company of two unknown companions who I could not say one name between, and certainly not their purpose. My introspection was broken as the one on the shore raised his head to acknowledge us. Beneath his hood were three distinct ember-like lights, bright and perhaps burning. They were set into a triangular pattern. Two must have been eyes, I thought. When he spoke, his voice had the most delicate echo of itself, a resonance that was almost imperceptible. When you emphasize the clandestine nature of tonight's events, Kazas, I thought surely you would swim instead of risking a boat. I was sure the name must have been spoken in error. If your people hear of their king adventuring in the middle of the night, well, that wouldn't do. This I keep to your confidence, Kaolian. As we stepped onto the shore, I found myself in stride with the high mortal of the Odasan dwarves, the one they dearly refer to as father, and yet fear with perfect respect. His might and discernment were emblazoned in the souls of every dwarf I had encountered. So great was the sacrifice of his yielded immortality. This was my ferryman, Kazaz, the refugee. At that moment, I stumbled completely in the thick snow, nearly tumbling back into the icy water while taking far too long to regain my balance. Mercifully, Kazar's full-throated laugh took attention off my flailing about, and the well-timed commentary from our newest companion at my expense kept the Dwarf King's laughter steady for several moments. <laughs> Rel Siren, you simmer speech like a master chef. But when his laughter abated, a soberness fell upon both of them. I wondered if those would be the only laughs we'd share on this journey. Narian Havensong, this is Rel Siren of Suroa, the Isle of the Archai. Rel Siren lowered his hood completely, and I noticed it was of a peculiar, almost mineral-like fabric. With light scrawls all over, yet it rested like cloth on his broad shoulders. Strands of his hair were white, hued with the snows beneath our feet. Of the three burning spots, two were indeed his eyes, yet they shimmered in the way of a jewel. The third burning was centered in the midst of his forehead, and the thinnest veins of glowing heat traced organically over his face, drawing from his mouth and eyes. Welcome, Narian. He donned the hood and started to lead us. My people will hear of your name and of this night, I believe. Kazas cleared his throat. Of course. Not for some time. The two of us followed him into the snowlands. I tell you very little of this portion of the journey, as it was miserable to endure, and truthfully, I don't recall much. I know we trekked for some time. More than once I thought I had been asleep, even as we walked. It seemed as if the darkness of the night were enhanced, as there was a gloom and shadow that hung in the air. It was bitterly cold and the land itself was frost-chapped. In the midst of these surroundings, the mere strides of my two companions, wedded with whatever mystical empowerments enhanced their bodies, transformed me once again into the child with sticks for weapons and I could not understand why I was there. For all those hours, I could barely discern our direction. 
At length, I drew the courage to stammer a question across my frigid lips. Where, King or Relsiren, where might we all, the three of us, where, 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 where are we traversing to? Both of them slowed their pace a bit. We are going to find your answers, Narian, Kazas replied. I whispered the statement back to myself, slowly realizing what was meant. We are skirting the tenebrous tundra, the great buffer between us and the kingdom underneath, and doing so at night for... The what? I cut in. Oh, forgive me. It's just that this certainty, not the tundra we traveled through on our way to Kadasa. What is Tenebris? And what kingdom could possibly exist out here? The heavy crunch of ice crystals lent a tense tempo to the weight. Relsiren's voice hung in the air, like the ribbons of the dim auroras in the sky above us. You have need of a king, human. But you may not have all the king's secrets. After this, we hiked in silence for an hour, perhaps. As we walked suddenly out of the endless murk, there appeared a towering silhouette before us. As I peered more carefully, I could see an array of them continuing into the distance. Whether of ice or stone or gold, so bizarrely dark were they, I could not tell. Kazasa's voice broke the quiet. How long will this take? Relsiren didn't turn. Moments, as I stated, he led us onto an icy sheet, as if a frozen river had formed, winding a path among these looming cliffs. The dwarf king continued, And how long will we have? That I cannot easily say, Relsiren replied as he motioned us to a stop. Before us was a sheer, uncut face of relatively tall cliffs, I could almost hear the Archai smile, his rocky arms lowering the simple but majestic hood. Yet as I watched Relsiren approach the base of the tower-like stone, I noticed an unnatural element upon the rock's surface. Beneath the high moon, the gloomy air around us seemed to thin as glimmers of light fanned out across the raw stone like an explosion frozen in time. Rising higher than even Kazas, this burst forth in two beautiful wings made of nothing but subtle metallic contrasts in the stone. A weave, painstaking and intricate, etched in a way that whispered of mastery, at once strikingly bold and yet soft and hidden. I have seen nothing like it on all of Terminus. Kazas cleared his throat and quite literally slid me behind himself, for in my study I failed to observe Relsiren's hunched posture, his cloak off and draped at his side. The thin ember lines that traced across his face were cut in deep red and orange veins over his bare, dark-muscled back. It was a vibrant contrast to the delicate flakes of snow falling and evaporating in his growing heat. He emitted a low rumble like a volcano building pressure. As I peered from beneath Kazasa's raiment, it appeared as if the Archai's hands were sunken into the rock. The glints in the cliffside began to glow. In moments, every last metal flake was alive, transformed into a glorious and scintillating shimmer. Then the radiant glints began to race within the stone itself. They flew like grains of sand before an approaching storm. But in perfect concert, their collective sound was a score of sizzles. When at last the bright symphony concluded, I gasped at what it had wrought. In a tremor, I turned my back to Gazas, but I heard the high mortal exhale and regarded again the company I was in. I thought of you, Kaolin and of our research, even the epic of our peoples, most having lost the desire to know why we have all been tethered here to terminus and displaced from our own respective worlds and realms. I have not lost that desire, nor, I think, have you. 
I stood there amidst the fading light smoldering around the heavy breath archive, discerning the image now visible in the still smoking stone. An insidious, winged dragon. Telnarsus, the snow dragon. <laughs> 